All right, good morning. We're going to do infection control. Review a little bit of safety. So in the uh, fifth or sixth edition, it's chapter six. Do occur, but we want to make sure we design our procedures or policies to mitigate any of these uh, occurrences from happening. So one thing is, well, physical hazards you want to eliminate like um, things in walkways, chemical biohazards, all stored and properly disposed of. Safety plan for minimum risk and established safety. So what happens if you don't have a safety plan? safety plan if you don't have one yeah by law you're gonna have to have a safety plan so do you guys know what to do if you get injured at school do you guys know the school safety plan for injuries no you don't know what to do just go home crying to mom so all we do here at school is we call 911 that's it there's no facility no clinic that we send you to it's just 911 and then when the ambulance come and you say, no, I don't want any of your help, then you take responsibility. Okay? So that's it. So if you get stuck by a needle in class, broken glass, fall down the stairs, we do have stairs, right? So at the other campus, somebody fell down the stairs, all we do, call 911. So now you guys know our safety plan. Halfway there. So written down, but now you guys know what it is for school. Every facility is going to have a little bit different one. And usually you have to be seen by one of their approved facilities within 24 hours. And if it's like a work related injury, what's the first thing they screen? Yeah, because if there's any drugs found in your system and there was a workplace injury, then the insurance may not be covered. So just know them, be familiar with them, and then follow them when they do occur. So if you don't have a specific standard right, or specific safety plan, then you're just going to follow the general duty clause. So at minimum, everybody follows the general standards for safety if you don't have your specific one. Who's the CDC? Center for Disease Control and now Prevention. So they changed their name, a little bit of their scope, but they didn't change the acronym. Biohazard labels. Okay. So what color is usually biohazard. What color? Red. Red. What else? What color is chemical waste? Orange. Orange, maybe. <laughs> uh, no more MSDS. Now they just call them safety data sheets. And um, we used to have hard copy. So there's like a binder in the lab, but nowadays it's just electronic. The only thing you need to train your employees is how to access it electronically. But uh, probably keep the most common used chemicals on hand at your facility. And it's real important for uh, like emergencies that you have it readily available. That way, um, emergency response team, they know what chemicals are in your facility. So who has the last call? It's always OSHA. So OSHA has the final say for any occupational safety. And it's usually OSHA. Don't deal with it. For electrical safety, um, just be 
be obvious about the safety. Um, avoid extension cores too many uh, for the tripping hazard and a fire hazard as well. Um, there's different types of fire. Make sure you use the appropriate extinguisher for fire. So there's different types. Um, most common CO2 and then there's uh, chemical extinguishers. You use them all the same way. And you guys know when to use a CO2 when to use a chemical so for um, for most common fi fires CO2 is fine but if you have like an oil or a grease fire what should you not put on an oil fire uh oh so if you have like a frying pan on your stove and it starts to flare up with flames, you don't want to put water, right? What are you supposed to put on it? Yeah. Uh-oh. So don't use water. <laughs> okay, grease fire. If there's an oil fire, yeah, don't use it. And then you want to prevent fires. Uh, like if you have oily rags, you can't keep them out because they'll spontaneously uh, burn. They'll start a fire. So you got to put those in a uh, metal container so the fumes won't catch on fire. All right, so when there's a fire, you guys just run out. <laughs> um, extinguisher, so use the pass method. First, P is to pull the pin. Next is aim. Third is to squeeze the handle. And then the last S is to sweep. And you want to aim where on the fire? Top, middle, or bottom? Bottom. Bottom, yeah. So you want to aim at the base of the fire. If we don't have a fire blanket, uh, usually they're vertical on the wall, and they're designed for you to walk over it, and as you pull it, you rotate, and you wrap that blanket around you. If you don't have a blanket, then just do the stop, drop, and roll method. You guys know our rendezvous area for fires and disasters. Have we gotten a drill? So the school will have a drill annually every year. And ours is easy. It's just the, uh, the east side of the parking lot. Evacuation procedures. So which patients do you evacuate first? The ones with help? The ones without help? You let them all go on their own? All right, so just follow your <laughs> facilities procedure. Um, for your department, you have to take a roll. So usually if there's a uh, fire, once uh, you meet at your rendezvous, you got to take a roll. So if you're, let's say you're in the uh, radiology department, you're going to have to take a roll and sign that you checked everything for that department. Oh, as mentioned, take the uh, safety data sheet with you during a, um, an emergency because you want to give this to the emergency response team. That way they know what chemicals there and how to treat the area. The assembly area for larger uh, disasters, you'll have multiple tarps for injuries. So one will be black, one will be green, yellow, red. And this is where they put the casualties. So black, what do you guys think happened there? Those are the dead. Right? And then based on your medical need, right? Go green, yellow, or red. Of course, red, most important medical need. That way they can prioritize. Have you guys been involved in a large scale 
disaster drill. Okay. If you have it, um, if there's a facility, a fire department, or a hospital that has one, try to observe it. It's pretty cool. If everything goes as planned, um, it's like a well-oiled machine. All right, MSDS, SDS, general precaution, Iowa stations. So ours are at the sink. Um, you guys know how to activate ours? It's pretty, pretty easy. Just pull the green. See how the green cap is facing away? All you got to do is turn it towards you and then stick your, stick your eyes in there. So it's 15 minutes of rinsing and you got to keep your eyeballs open. Uh, what happens if you have metal in the eyes? Like shards of metal. Filings. Sometimes they'll um, they'll use magnets to help take it out. And if you have an eye injury, if you have like a paper cup, take that over the injured eye to prevent any further damage. Chemical safety. Yeah, don't hold it under your nose. The vapors may be toxic. And but what if you want to? smell the contents how would you yeah just hold it away from you and just with use your hand to pull some of those vapors towards you if you need to smell it you can use a hood so here there's vacuum for anything volatile combustible you want to make sure you're using a fume hood Combining chemicals, so you have water and your chemical. Do you add your water to the chemical or do you take the chemical and you add it to the water? Which way is safer? Water to the chemical. Okay, splashing. Which? What would splash if you put water into the chemical or chemical into the water? What's more likely to splash out? Dun, dun, dun. So... Usually the um, preferred method is you want to add the toxic stuff to your benign stuff. Right? So usually if this is water and you're pouring that acid in, right? and if it splashes out, it's mostly water that splashes out. Right? So add acids to other stuff. Anything dangerous, you want to add it to the benign stuff. You guys know what a pipette is? It's a measuring straw. T R A I. So it's a glass tube and it's for measuring liquids. And they used to suck up blood, suck up urine, any other chemicals by their mouth. Now you got to use a little squeeze bulb to create that suction. Cleanup spills. We have fluorescent powder. So, I'll plan for it week two. So what I'll do is I'll take that fluorescent powder, I'll mix it with a little liquid, and I can pretend that is bodily fluid. That could be blood. So you guys have your gloves on. You'll know how to put on gloves and take off gloves aseptically. So what I'll do is I'll contaminate your gloves with the mock blood, right? just the, the powder, fluorescent powder and water. And then I'll have you take off your gloves wash your hands and then I'll shine the black light over your body to see if you're able to prevent contamination. Another exercise for cleaning up spills is using the same substance, that fluorescent powder. Uh, I'll make a spill. Um, I'll simulate like a beaker falling down and then I'll have you guys use the cleanup kit, the spill kit to clean it up, see if you guys get everything. And then we'll come back in with the black light, see if you cleaned everything in the area and then we'll shine it on you as well. See if you were able to prevent contamination. Ergonomics. So laptops are terrible for ergonomics because it makes the screen down here and then everyone gets a tablet neck, right? So if you have an external keyboard, try to use that.
All right, healthy posture. So all these angles, never overreach. And how should your wrist be? Should it be straight, bent up, or bent down to tight? Bent down to tight, bent up to tight, or straight? Yeah, should be straight. So that pad will help you prevent um, swelling that may cause carpal tunnel. And they just call it CTS, carpal tunnel syndrome. Strongest muscles in your body are in your, where are the strongest muscles in your body? Yeah, in your leg. So that means you want to lift with your legs. Ask for assistance if you need to. And uh, in your nursing courses, you'll learn how to use the lift and the straps to help move patients in and out of wheelchairs, up and out from a seated position. Walk, don't run. Yeah, common. Wipe up spills immediately, especially if they're biohazard substances. And then, of course, clear the floors. Carrying objects. You will get in trouble for injuring yourself if you don't use a cart, if you don't use the appropriate equipment. So just be careful. Just because you get injured doesn't mean you're going to qualify for workers' comp. If it's your fault, then you're not going to be... Um, you're not going to be compensated. For example, um, I'm an instructor here at campus. I'm supposed to teach. So if something went wrong with the projector and I got up on a ladder and I fiddled around with it and I fell over, will I be covered for workers' comp? It's my job duty to fix equipment in the building. Right? So I have to send a IT re request and then the trained people get up on the ladder and then they fix it. Right? So within your scope or your job description. Right. Ah, common stuff. PPEs. So we'll practice PPEs next week after we get the hand washing and gloving and degloving down. All right, medical assistance role. So prevent infection. So during flu season, how long can the virus live on inanimate objects called formites? So if someone with the flu virus sneezed on the table and they landed on the table, how long do you think that virus is infectious for? One minute? One hour? One day? What do you guys think? One month. one month. Wow, she's pessimistic. We got one month as a guess, all right? Higher or lower? Do any of you guys think they can be viable, infect you after a month or less than a month? Out of state? Okay, yeah, just to see if there's different um, disease trends from where you're coming from. So it's two weeks. So the flu virus, if somebody sneezed here two weeks ago and we didn't do anything and we came back two weeks later, technically you can get infected. So clean, clean, clean all the time. Understand how infections occur. So it's usually dense dense population, dense areas. So if you come from certain countries that are known to have TB, then we'll just screen you for it. Or if you come from a country that vaccinates for TB, we got to take the appropriate steps as well. All right, last thing, we'll take a little, take a little break, is 
the uh, infection cycle. And this is where the terms come in. So you got the host reservoir. So this guy definitely is ill. Let's just say it's the flu. So the flu is in him and it has to exit his body. So here he is coughing. All right. So how long is that virus viable for? All right, two weeks. So don't share your soda. Can I get a bite of that sandwich? So means of transmission. So in this case, this is an inanimate object. It's not living. So they call these things formites, things that are not living that can transfer. If you are living and you transfer diseases, we call you a vector. So just a different nomenclature for living and non-living things. Means of entrance. So for the flu, if it enters the eyes, nose, or mouth, then it can pass through the mucous membrane in the eyes, nose, or mouth, and then enter into your body and infect you. So during flu season, make sure you don't touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. And then the susceptible host is exposed. And you only get infected if you are susceptible, right? Certain people are immune to certain diseases, so they would not continue the cycle of infection. All right, so these slides will just quickly review um, the cycle of infection. So the host reservoir must be able to be infected with the pathogen. So the pathogen is the thing that causes the disease. Right? It can come from the inside so we have bacteria in our body that's normally in its place. But if it goes somewhere else, right, like outside of our GI system, then that will cause an infection in us. And then X generis is from the outside. So you picked it up, not from anything that's normally in the body. Has to exit, in this case, coughing but it could be a cut, anything that allows the pathogen to exit the body. Next, means of transmission. So because this is an inanimate object, it's considered a formite. If it was living, they would call it a vector. Right? Airborne, so you have droplets, and then you have particulate. P -A -R -T -I -C particles. So what's the difference? Which one is more dangerous? Are droplets more dangerous? Are particulate matter more dangerous? What do you guys think? How long can water stay in the air? How long can mist stay in the air? When you're talking, when you're speaking, you're spitting, you're breathing in and out a lot of vapor. So if it's droplet precaution, it's just three feet. So if you're three feet or closer to the patient, then you'll need additional personal protective equipment. If it's a particulate, an example would be tuberculosis. Make sure you put on a, not just a mask, but a HEPA mask. So which one's more dangerous, droplet precaution or particulate? Particulate, way more dangerous. You need a HEPA mask to filter it out. Regular mask, exam mask, won't help you. Bloodborne, easy enough, bodily fluids. Our blood is supposed to be sterile. So human blood is sterile. Other animals, there could be living stuff in there, right? other bacteria, parasites. Pregnancy to birth, HIV, mother to child, HIV does not pass from mother to child during pregnancy. The placenta is able to, I guess, prevent HIV from infecting the child. S same with um, Hep B. Usually the only time the child would be exposed is during 
the birth process where there's blood and bodily fluids. So if we know the mother's HIV positive, we can prepare for it and the child won't contract HIV. If we know the mother is hepatitis B positive, then we can treat the child and the child never gets these diseases. So spreads from hosts. So foodborne, which hepatitis is foodborne? Pick a letter, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, L, M, N, O, P, Hep A. So Hep A is water. So fecal matter, fecal contamination, water. So uh, restaurants, certain foods aren't cooked. You can contract hepatitis A from those food workers. B, C, D, those are gonna be bloodborne. Vector born, living or dead? So this is a living intermediate host. Do you guys know what the Black Death was? The plague killed two thirds of the world's population. Do you guys know what caused it? What was it? You don't know? Black Death, the Black Plague, bubonic plague. So it killed two thirds of the world population back in medieval times. Well, what happened was, um, I guess they got rid of all the cats in the city. And what are cats good at? Killing. Cats are killers. Like your normal house cat, they'll kill birds, rodents, etc. So it wasn't the cats that was carrying uh, the disease. It was the mice and rats. But it wasn't them that was actually carrying the disease. It was the fleas that were on the mice and rats. Right. So if you eliminate cats, then the rat population goes crazy and you got tons of fleas. So for us, we have this guy called the West Nile. What spreads West Nile virus? Mosquitoes. So for us, mosquitoes are one of the largest vector. And then there's tons of crazy diseases that's always popping up through mosquitoes. What was the outbreak in South America with mosquitoes? No member? You're not pregnant? Don't want to get pregnant? Remember Zika? Zika that caused uh, microencephaly, small head. So vectors are living. Formites are going to be non-living. So the example in the lecture was the cup. The host spread the disease to the glass. Means of entrance. So for the flu shot, for the flu, we have mucous membranes in our eyes, right? So the conjunctiva, that's a mucous membrane. In our nose, definitely, our nasal mucous membrane. And in our mouth, very thin skin that allows for direct passage. Breaks in the skin, cuts and abrasions. And then, um, sometimes through the GI tract as well. So the host must be susceptible. So if you're vaccinated, a lot of times you're no longer susceptible. You won't get that disease. Environmental factors. So it's just dense population. It's the most important thing. Um, in, in England, this is hundreds of years ago. They used to have a window tax. Can you believe it? They went around, the, they look at your home, and if you have blah, 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 so many windows, they would tax you. So if I was a slumlord, right, and I wanted to pack in tons and tons and tons of people in my apartment building, what would I do with all these windows? They bricked them all up, and there's certain rooms that wouldn't have any daylight. It would all be closed off because of this crazy, I don't know, king or whatever that collected window taxes. Animals and insects. We talked a little bit about mosquitoes. Do you guys live with pets? What do they carry? <laughs> Fleas, mites, ticks. Ticks are scary. Why? What do they give you? 
Have you ever heard of Lyme disease? So Lyme disease is still a mystery. There's a lot of different bacterias. And it's not even a bacteria. It's like a partial weird bacteria that causes diseases. And a lot of diseases are actually probably caused by ticks or a version of Lyme disease. Economic political factors. Well, we talked about economic factors, right? That's the England thing. Political factors? Maybe. Where's there a lot of HIV in the world? Africa. I don't know. That might be political. Who knows? Um, public transportation. So, trains. Have you guys seen the videos of trains in India? Of people packed on top of each other, on top of each other. So, British England, when they uh, occupied England, they just made the trains to get things back and forth. So, when they left, now they didn't expand the trains at all. It's the same system, nothing's been added, nothing been improved, but the population has increased. And you've seen some of those uh, videos where the only thing that's in the train is like your arm. Because you're hanging outside. Mm, which area in San Diego should you stay away from? Because of sexually transmitted infections. So I think this study was like a few years ago. And I think it was more for teenagers. I think it was like 13 to 25. That was the age group. But it was Oceanside. <laughs> that was pretty bad. I can't remember the exact uh, study, but it was for specific uh, STIs as well. Not all of them. I think it was just like gonorrhea and chlamydia that they were studying. So stay away from Oceanside if you're 13 to 25. Breaking the cycle. So A is without, sepsis is living stuff. So of course, we can lower the amount of infectious agents, but we can't kill it all sometimes. So your house cleaning, your cleaning is just sanitation. That's it. Sanitation just brings the level of organisms down. It doesn't kill them all. Educate patient. Um, yes, you do need to brush daily. Maybe bathe daily. So some patients, they were never taught that. They, they don't know. When should you put on deodorant and antiperspirant? When, though? In the morning, in the afternoon, or at night? Did you guys read the directions? No. So when, are you supposed to, when do you guys put it on? Right after you shower. No. So if you read the directions for antiperspirant, you're supposed to use it the night before so it can actually work the next day. So read depending on the type. So even that, you might have to train your patient. Hey, are you using any antiperspirant? You know you're supposed to use that the night before. It'll work better. And then um, you got to change it up because your body will adjust to it. So you got to train the patient, educate the patient. Hey, every three, six months, you might want to change up. Right. Bloodborne pathogen. So employees must have that control plan so again for me if i get stuck in the lab what do i do call 911 right you've got to get injured at school what do you guys do call 911 right? so you'll be trained annually on your ppes your osha your hipaa every time you get a review hepatitis b vaccine should be offered and yeah, they'll do testing. Universal precaution versus standard precaution. What is the difference? Do you guys know the difference? So it used to be they only worried about the healthcare worker and them not getting infected. So that was like your universal precaution. Now it's standard precaution. It's going to apply to everybody. So not just only the worker, like OSHA usually protects the worker, 
but here we don't want to spread infection to the patient, workers, other workers, other business partners that may visit our facility. So we don't want infection to spread at all. So not just for the worker safety, but everybody. Uh, levels of risk. So really the only one you gotta watch out for is level one. So this means there's danger. So specific danger so much that they say, hey, you have to wear these protective gear while you're dealing with blood, right? Anytime you're dealing with blood, right? Uh, there's no tolerance. You have to be wearing gloves, right? Or other bodily fluids. Level two, only in certain situations. Right? So low chance of spreading infection, but you still should. And then lastly, um, no protection at all. So when you're doing a uh, physical examination of a patient, if there's no broken skin, then you don't have to wear gloves. The doctor's just gonna examine you directly. So if you're exposed, determine the level exposure. So if it was a needle stick, was that the needle stick before or after it entered the patient? Because if you're just drawing up medication and you haven't stuck anybody and you're careless for some reason, you poked yourself, were you exposed to anything? No, all right. It's only when you injected into a patient and something happened Right? You didn't follow the procedure correctly or the safety device malfunction, who knows? And then you got stuck. That's that's what they mean by determining it. How likely? So if you get stuck, rinse. Rinse with plenty of soapy water and then get medical attention immediately. So for your facility, they may have a, a particular clinic you go to. If you're in the hospital, they'll probably treat you on site. And then record for your review. OSHA may ask for all of your incidences. In school, we keep a record. So the dean has a record of how many sticks, how many people fell down. At the other campus, we actually had a, had a student um, fall down the stairs. We had to do an incident report. Hepatitis B vaccination. So usually before, before employment, they'll have you uh, do your Hep B vaccination. Safety devices. Recapping. We do not recap needles. So if you're using syringes and needles, Definitely do not recap or attempt to recap after it entered the patient, after you injected the patient. You're gonna use the safety device. So make sure you know how to use the safety device. There's different types. There's safety devices where you pull and then there's a sheath that covers the needle. There's other safety devices that you press down. Just make sure you're, you're familiar with the one you're using. Try not to use needles. Right. That's one thing uh, that we can do is we can spike these vials. So instead of using a sharp needle, you just spike the vial once and then there's a port that will accept syringes and you can draw your drug. Safety devices, always. Never recap. Um, even if you're drawing up multiple drugs, uh, if you have to, uh, you need to recap using one hand only. So you have to use the the scoop method. You put the cap on the tabletop, and then you're gonna scoop the cap and close it. So one hand only. Sharps versus biohazard versus regular trash. So sharps, needles, 
glassware, syringes, all go into the sharps container. So you injected the patient, let's say it's the deltoid for their flu shot, into the muscle, and then there's a little drop of blood. Okay, take the gauze, you wipe that blood with the gauze. Where do you put that trash? Does it go in the biohazard container or does it go into the regular trash? Regular trash. If it's just a little drop of blood and your gauze is not soaking, not dripping wet with blood, then it's just regular trash. Most likely not going to be infectious, but if it is dripping, Let's say you did the flu shot, you hit a vein, and then there's a big old long trail of blood down their arm, and you had to use multiple pieces of gauze, and it's soaking, that goes in the biohazard. So we have both. We have the uh, sharps container, and then the one where you kick open the lid, that one is the biohazard for anything soaking. Medical asepsis. So, is this 100% sterile? No. So, we sanitize. That's your everyday cleaning when you mop the floor with bleach, right? You're not killing everything. You're just bringing the level down. Medical asepsis or disinfection, you bring the level down even more. Right? So, here instruments got blood on it like scalpels scissors right? sanitizing is you're gonna wipe off all that visible blood right? when you do the in disinfection now you're gonna soak that instrument in a solution maybe a bleach solution and you let it sit clean and then if you really really want it super clean then you're gonna put it in the autoclave and then that's going to make it sterile, right? Nothing should be living after that. So that is surgical asepsis. Nothing living. Now, we want to be even cleaner than that. We don't even want any dead bacteria or any dead fungus. We want those things to be eliminated as well because they can cause a reaction, those endotoxins. Keep your office clean. So if I take a look at your ladies' cars, is it clean or dirty? How's your car? The interior, is there coffee stain? Does it smell like a nursery in there? No, because what your car looks like most likely is what your house is gonna look like. So it's a good measure. How about your purse? Is your purse nice and organized or is everything just jumbled in? Can't find anything else. Usually that's an indicator. So if your office area, the reception area, is nice and clean, what is that an indication of? The back office is probably going to be nice and clean as well because if they can clean, they have time to clean the reception area, then definitely they can clean in the back. Alcohol base. So make sure that you allow that alcohol to cover all areas in between your fingers under the nails and you allow it to dry on its own. You don't want to wipe it off or shake your hands. You just want that alcohol to dry naturally. And you need that evaporation time to actually disinfect. If you don't use it correctly, it's not going to reduce any bacteria. I mentioned your guys' lovely nails. So natural, I don't even think you're supposed to put on a clear coat and they're short. Can't even be past, past your fingertips. Nada, no crystal gel, nothing. Sinks are dirty. It's probably cleaner to eat over your toilet than over your kitchen sink. Because your kitchen sink, there's food there and there's water all the time. The toilet, nice and cold. Probably sterile. 
avoid touching face because of those mucous membranes. You don't want to transfer the pathogens through your conjunctiva in your eyes, nose, or mouth. Sneeze in your hands and then touch everything. All right, cover, cover your mouth when you cough. So the best thing is to cough on the inside of your elbow. Because if you cough in your hands, you're going to be touching everything else. Don't go to work. Don't come to class. Flu season. One person gets it. Students start dropping like flies. So just be careful. Stay home. Don't spread the infection. PPEs. Uh, we'll do this week two. We'll gown up. And then I will contaminate you with that fluorescent liquid. I'll have you guys clean yourselves off and then we'll see if there's any glow in the dark left. Highest risk, the only ones that are really that brought up uh, standard precaution was in the 90s. In the 1990s when there was the AIDS epidemic, that's when they really started focusing on uh, workplace infection. Whatever law is more stringent, make sure you follow it. So if you have local laws that conflict with federal laws, make sure you follow the stringent, most stringent. Reporting. This is all for preventing any spread. And this is something we are mandated to report. Right. So you guys are familiar with HIPAA. Health Insurance, Portability, and Accountability Act. So health information is protected, protected health information. And we can't share any information. We're not supposed to. It's supposed to be confidential. But if they have a communicable disease, and there's a whole list of them, we have to report it. All right, not too bad. Let's go ahead and start lab. So partner up or work in groups. What you'll need to do is get eval and then do an eval. So um, one for the hand washing. So have someone eval you. And then you can just jump right into the gloving as well right after you hand wash. So, and then just switch roles. So you have to do... An evaluation on a student and then you get evaluated as well.